You're listening to Inside Real Estate, your source for all things mortgage and real estate related. The show that brings you all the hottest topics and insights directly from those who know it most. Now sit back and enjoy the show. You like that? That's so soothing. I do. It's, it's good, <laughs> Is that right? like one of the Spice Girls? <laughs> <laughs> it's, yeah, it's crazy Spice. Yeah. I think she's crazy, actually. It's What's awesome. up, everyone? Paul Paslakis. Uh, you got Salvatore Cusmano, Brad Weisgerber. Very special guest today, Mr. Bob Walters from Quicken Loans, the president. Broke the internet today. Broke the internet. He broke the internet. Just took it down. So we were trying to... <laughs> We were trying to get out. We were trying to get online. There's a bunch of people trying to get and watch us, and we, we screwed it all up. Yeah, well. well, I think it's your fault, actually. Mostly. All right. Yeah. We so, submitted we'll, the ticket. We'll blame Zuckerberg. Yeah. yeah it's all Zuckerberg's Zucker. fault. So, um, Bob, obviously, you come from Quicken Loans. Uh, you've been there for a long. I mean, you've been there since 1997. Yep. So you've you've kind of been there from the very beginning, really. Um, yeah. You know, then. it's interesting when I got. So the company was founded in 1985. Dan founded it with his brother and, a, and another gentleman. And um, so I got there, I guess, 12 years into it. But we were about 240, 250 people when I got there. Yeah. Now the family company is 17,000 people. So it's been an, it's been an incredible journey. Company. That's crazy. So just so the audience knows, I, I was there in 2003. Mm-hmm. And it was like, you know, just beca- you know, quick. It was just kind of getting rolling. People didn't know what an online mortgage was. Well, it was crazy. Yep. Like, like nobody really, was, it was like doing a mortgage online. Like, what are you talking, like the internet had just been born, yeah. right? It was kind of nuts. Well, it was great because people was like, there's no chance no anyone chance. is ever going to do a loan online. It's just not going to happen. Never. No way. And then they'll certainly never do a purchase loan online. That'll never happen. Never. And so, you know, we were proud to last year to become the largest lender in the country. And, and, and again, it's all out of centralized um, centers in Cleveland and Detroit and in Phoenix. And then if you look at our purchase business now, it just our purchase business, we'd be the fifth largest lender in the country. That's so wild. it just really just shows uh, how much things change. You no, know, people would have said, "There's no way people are going to buy shoes on the internet. It's just not going to happen." Right. And you got Zappos, and there's no way the largest retailer in the country is going to be online. Things change. It's right. just interesting. Like you to mean watch. I'm not, I'm not going to walk into a Best Buy anymore? Yeah. When's the last time anybody walked into a Best Buy? Last week. You know, you, you do your thing. <laughs> but you're, but you're you walk thing. in and then you you take a picture of the thing and you order it on Amazon, yeah, right? Yeah. Right. Like I get it cheaper on Amazon. Get it cheaper, right. right? So yeah. So obviously, I mean, Quicken. I mean, really, like changed the the perception of how to do a mortgage. And and you, and you and as a company, you guys have been really on the forefront of technology, of of of, of growth, of of just ch- doing things different, right? Yeah. And a lot of that goes into your isms and a lot of the things that you guys believe in uh, as a company. So so kudos to that, obviously. Yeah. Um, so today, what I, w- I really want to talk about three things with you. Okay. I want to talk about the market. Okay. I want to talk about this whole uh, broker hotel, the whole, that whole thing. But we won't get you know too far into it. And then I also want to talk to you about technology. Yeah. I think those are three things that you, that you guys are, are are really going into right now. So let's talk about the market. Obviously, you you've been through a lot. Yeah. Um, I used to listen to you. Uh, I used to leave just audience knows. I used to work at Quicken and. And Bob would leave voice messages for the whole team and tell them what's going on in the market. It was like a market update. It was awesome. It really taught me a lot. But then we went, you know, 2008 happened. You kind of lived through that. It was like very, it was an anomaly kind of situation, right? Um, And then we've come out of that since then. Um, So right now, it's kind of a weird place because we've been on fire for the last like 10 years, right? Mm -hmm. What do you see happening going forward from here? Yeah, you know it's it's fascinating. It's it's the ten year anniversary now. Yeah, it, I think it was August when Lehman Brothers collapsed. Yeah, and I and I remember that, and anybody in our industry remembers that. And I I came up through the capital market side, and so during that period of time, watching the financial institutions that we all had taken, you know, we believed were just solid rocks, watching mm-hmm. them starting to crumble, was fascinating. I was. Just as a lot of the news reports last week or last month talked about that that ten year anniversary, I remembered yeah. where I was, and I remembered you know all these different things happening, and legitimately thinking that that you know we could we could lose it all. Every mortgage company relies on warehouse lines of credit, and warehouse lines of credit comes from banks, and banks were in deep trouble, and it was just a fascinating, scary, difficult time. But to your point, what I think is interesting is how what's happened since. Yeah. And I think there's a lesson there and we'll get to the market side in a second, but for sure. The lesson is when actually sometimes everybody, nobody wants really, really bad, tough times. Nobody wants that. 
But keep in mind when all heck is breaking loose, Mm -hmm. when terrible things, that there is opportunity everywhere. And so, yes, a lot of a lot of mortgage companies, a lot of institutions got crushed. But coming out of it, there were a bunch of companies that really took advantage and really did well. And there was tons of opportunity for the companies that were run well and the companies that took advantage of, of both technology and then had the right cultural makeup to go forward. And I, I look at Quicken Loans, and I, the last 10 years have been a, some of our best 10 years. We didn't want to have to go through 2008. Nobody did. No. But coming out of it was an extraordinary opportunity. So I always like, like times, you know, things are getting a little tougher right now. Certainly nothing like they were 10 no, years right, ago. Right, right. And, and so, you know, people in our industry are like really struggling, fighting for their businesses in many cases. And it's tough. But I think that you keep in mind like this, this is a tough time. But this is where this is where careers are made. This is where businesses are made is in the tough times, often more so than in the good times. So I think that, that that's just one reflection on that. As far as where we're going, um, you know, I, it's pretty clear that, that the economy is doing, doing really well. Mm-hmm. I mean, I saw something yesterday. One of the Fed governors said this is like the Goldilocks kind of times. Interest rates are pretty low. Um, inflation is pretty low. Unemployment is low. Oftentimes, you, see, you don't see that. You mm-hmm. see, like, you know, when, when employment is really low, you see inflation kicking up, which pushes rates up. But, but rates, rates are ticking up. The Fed is taking short-term rates higher. They're going to do it a couple times, maybe two or three times next year, take rates higher, yep. short-term rates higher. Mm-hmm. The question is, what does that do to longer-term rates that we mm-hmm. care about in our industry? And, and, you know, anybody in our industry knows that it's not a one-to-one. When the Fed pushes short-term rates up a quarter, that doesn't necessarily push long-term rates up a quarter. And, in fact, right now, we have a super flat yield curve. We don't want to go into nerdville here in a second. <laughs> but, but meaning short-term rates and long-term rates are about the same. Right. Usually, when you get a really flat yield curve or even an inverted, meaning longer-term rates start to get lower than, than short-term rates, that's basically the market predicting potentially a recession. Yeah. I'm not so sure that that's the case. But we, this this expansion is now 10 years old, right. and that's pretty long. That's a long cycle. And so, so will we see a recession? I don't think we'll see a recession in the next couple of years. And I think interest rates stay generally low. But it, but here we, we're probably, what, in the low fives, high fours for yeah. a 30-year yeah. fixed? If you ask me to bet in 2019 – I think we stay in a half point range from where we are now. I don't think we see them rocketing above 6%. And I also don't think that we're going to see them fall much below 4.5%. Now, it's a point and a half range, but I, I think you stay in that five to five and three quarter kind of a kind of an area. That would be my prediction. Do you but think, then, do you think the Fed policy of, of, you know, they've been buying bonds for so long? Yep. Right. And they've been really stimulating the, the economy, kind of protecting it. Now there's that safety net's gone. Yep. Right. So if you're if, if, if the market now, you know, if there's if something happens, there's no more like, hey, we're going to help you out. Right. And the Fed kind of said that with their last minutes. Right. Uh, they're not going to be accommodative anymore. Right. So th- how does that play in everything? You know, basically accommodative. I, I like the now I like analogies, but the, my analogy on this is accommodative means that they're pushing on the gas pedal mm-hmm. instead of. But right now, they're if they're if they're like tightening, they're pushing on the brake. Yeah. If they're accommodative, um, then they're pushing on the gas pedal. Right now, like the feet are off Cruise both control. the brake and the gas it's pedal. Coasting. They're saying, okay, this economy is doing its thing. Right. We're good with it. We're going to stay with it. Um, but over the last ten years, they went. They like had it. They had the accelerator buried. buried. Yeah. I think they were pushing it through the floorboard. Yeah. I mean, not only were they take they took short rates. Short-term rates down to darn near mm-hmm. zero, right? And they started buying mortgage-backed securities, trillions of dollars of it, and so that was very stimulative. Right now, they're backed off. They're basically saying this economy is fine on its own, so we're not yeah. gonna we're not gonna push. Well, I think to the consumer, they have to realize, you know, how spoiled they were the past ten years, basically. Real, you know, it's it comes down to de- probably redefining what a low rate is. Oh, you, you know, a record right. low is yeah. different than still a low rate. Five percent? What are you, ta- dude? Chill out. I mean, it's really not that bad, yeah. right? It's not that bad. So, yeah, it, it's interesting. I'm, I'm really like, uh, it, it's an interesting time. Like, it's been like through these last ten years, a lot, you know, a lot of different things have happened that have, that, you know, in the past you haven't seen the Fed be so active in the market. I mean, they really basically propped it up and and saved it on some level, right? Well, and this housing market's been rebuilt, basically rock solid on solid loans. 
Yeah. Right. Well, that's true. I mean, so so every crisis is different. Mm-hmm. That's the thing. Yeah. Anybody who says, "Oh, is the next crisis going to be?" It'll, it's always a little bit different. And um, you know, the one in the the big crash in in the Great Depression in the mm-hmm. ni- late nineteen twenties was largely driven by you know a stock market crash and uh, you know a number a number of other things. The one ten years ago was a housing bubble. You just had way too much speculation going on in the housing market. And the housing market is such a big part of our country's economy that when that got overinflated and then started to come in, it just took things with it. So it started taking down lenders and bondholders. And so that's that's what took it down. The next crash, we'll have one. There'll be another one in yeah, our future. We don't yeah. know when, but it'll it'll be right. something else. And they're all they all have something in common. And that generally is is that certain things get overheated, whether it's a labor market, whether it's a housing market, whether it's a stock market, they just get overheated. Yeah. They become too speculative. People, there's too much money. And then when they start to crumble, um, those losses then start to spread. And that's what always hits that. So what, what would you speculate is going to be the yeah. cause of the next one? <laughs> 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 I, I agree with you that it's, it's going to happen. That, it's bound to happen. Loans. It's a cycle. Yeah. Who knows, I mean, right? you follow a lot of markets. You know a lot of things that happen in, in the economy. What do you think, if you're speculating, I'm not going to hold you to it, but what would what's going to drive the next one? You know, right? I don't see I don't see a lot of asset bubbles at the point. I mean, you you can look regionally and you can say, oh, Southern California, or you can see some. And there are always going to be some regional bubbles. The regional bubbles don't take economies down. It's generally national bubbles yeah, that yeah. do that. And then on a national basis, while housing prices have increased, I don't see any stuff that's just bananas like we saw no. in the past. Stock market. While pricey is not something where you're like, that's, in, I mean, you know, price to earnings ratios are on the high side, but they're not just through the roof where you're like, that's just craziness. So I don't see, I don't see that. It seems the next one, you know, it might be some kind of an external event. God, you know, God mm-hmm. forbid a war or, or right. some that's kind of a, tra- a trade embargo. Like if we got into a trade war with China and other com- uh, countries, if that fully broke out, that could trigger a recession. Something like that. Those right. are the kinds of things like, that might might do that. I think it's crypto. Cryptocurrency is going to take us down. You think? Well, I lost a shit ton of money on it. So. <laughs> <laughs> it took you down. Yeah, it took, it took me down personally. So uh, awesome. Well, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of things happening in the market. Uh, I do want to talk a little bit, and I want the audience to kind of understand this. There's there's two kind of parts of the business, right? You've got retail, which is you know more consumer direct, but that you guys do a lot of. And then you got guys like us, who's a broker, who have different options from from investors or, or partners that that we used uh, to 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 do mortgages, um, and for for a very long time. I mean, Quicken was very just retail driven, right? And uh, I think recent, not recently, but it's been some time now. But you guys have recently in your history started doing wholesale. So I, I'm curious to you, and I know you're you're kind of heading a lot of that. How is that going? Um, where is that going? Um, and, and being that the perception of Quicken being retail for so long, um, can both those coexist within the same house? Does that make sense? Yeah, I, mean, I think absolutely. I I think really that there's retail, meaning the per, the, the company is doing business directly yeah. with the consumer. So you get, you guys are retail, right? And yeah. and so and then there is what I'll call correspondent, meaning companies that are buying closed loans, loans that have closed. Right. That's the way I see the world. Um, and and but so when we think about what we're doing through Quicken Loans Mortgage Services QLMS, it's really an extension. The way it is is you've got tens of thousands of mortgage brokers, small business people. And, you know, we've been talking about the economy. And when I, the, more than 50% of the employee employers in our country um, have 50 employees or less, or less. That is the bedrock of our economy is small business. It just flat out is. And so everybody talks about the General Electrics and the General Motors and stuff like that. And they're, of course, important. But the small business, that's where innovation comes from. And that's what really drives things. And I even, in our industry, that the mortgage brokers are a huge driver of what's happening in our industry. They're the ones with relationships on the street. They're the ones who understand, you know, know the realtors really well. There's lots of folks. So the way I see it is, what have we built at Quicken Loans? We've built a lot of things. We've built a lot of technology, and we continue to build technology and innovate because innovation is what drives everything. Yeah. Innovation is what drives economies. Innovation is dr- what drives um, social change. Innovation is what drives things. And so we have more than 2,000 people, for example, in our technology group. And so we're building that technology. It's massive, by the way. And then we've That's also huge. built a huge amount of process. And so how do we 
How do we take advantage of that in a lot of different ways? And so, of course, we've got a retail platform, but to the, ex- to the, to the extent that we can extend that to the broker community and also bring in great high-quality loans and help the, the broker community it's a win-win. And that's really how we think about that and um, what we get excited about. When I talk to a lot, of, a lot of brokers, they've got the relationships. That's not their issue. They've got their cultures in, on their teams. They know their communities. What they don't have is technology, right? They don't have the, the money. They don't have the expertise to hire lots and lots of people in technology. And so they need to work with companies that can help provide that technology to let them do what they be- do best. You know, I always say around our office, um, let's build processes and systems such that let computers do what computers do well so humans can do what humans do well. And usually I'm referring to, you know, if you've got a human sitting there taking a piece of paper and, and looking at it and keying in information all day long, that's not what humans do, w- do really well. A computer could do that better and let the human do things. Like computers, what are computers good at? They're good at automation. They're good at rep- repetitive things. What do, human, or what do computers suck at? Computers suck at building relationships. They, they suck at influencing and persuading other human beings. They suck at empathy. They're not good at those kinds of things. Humans are really good at those kinds of things. Some. <laughs> Some. <laughs> not, not you. But no. in our business, the ones that are good at it are the ones who thrive. The ones who build businesses around right. that thrive. But, but if they then have to pay lots and lots of people to do all this automation, and if, they're, if, if they rely on their clients to do a lot of work, like, okay, okay, send me this document and that document and this document and that document and come here and do this and answer this phone call versus a much more automated process, um, that's the key. So very long answer. That is what we think our value add. And we've more than doubled this year, yeah. and, and, that, and that's exciting. And so... Part of it is being very intentional about growing, but a lot of it is the value proposition we're providing. So to, to that point, I know I know Quicken and I know the culture, it, generally you guys don't do things half-assed, right? So is your goal on the, on the wholesale side to be the, 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 the number one wholesale lender in the, in the country? Is that, is that where you're going? Yeah, you know, it's, we don't sit there and obsess about that, yeah. um, but... But but you're right, and I and I think this is for any company that is is well run, that has a great culture, that believes in itself. That's the you know it's not like well I, I here we have a one of our isms is numbers and money follow they do not lead. Right. And what that means is if you're like my goal is to make a ton of money, that is my number one goal is to make a ton of money. Those people rarely do. Right. But the, if it's like you think about a Jeff Bezos for example. I bet his goal when in 1997 or whenever he started Amazon was not like, I want to be the richest guy in the world. That <laughs> right, is what yeah. it's all about. He was just like, I want to be, it started with, I want to be the number one online bookseller. I want to change the way people buy books. And then I want to change the way people buy this. And it kept, it's, remember we talked about innovation. I want to change this. I want to make this better. One click, Amazon Prime, all these kinds mm-hmm. of things. And then you wake up one day and you're like, oh crap, all that worked. And now, not oh crap, oh great. Now I'm the richest guy in the world. It followed. It didn't lead. Mm-hmm. It's the same thing for us. Right. It is constant. And innov- we don't sit there and go, "What well, we need to be number one. Well, we need to make the most money. It is, can we innovate? Can we make things that consumers are delighted by, that brokers are delighted by, that anybody, and it just makes it better and better. And if you do those things, the money follows. Yeah, we talk about something like that a lot as well. We don't call it innovation or we don't talk, how can we innovate this or that. It's, we always talk about how do we add value? Right? How do we add value to the buyers out there? How do we add value to the real estate agents? How do we add value to everyone we touch? Because it's not financially driven. It's more we know if we add value to whoever we talk with, whatever relationships we have, we're going to be successful. Right. right? I mean, so it's kind of the same thing, which is kind of cool. Where you end up is just a scorecard. Right. Right. That's, that's exactly right. You it's, know, it's you're, either, card, yeah. you're either number one or you're not. And that's only indicative of what you do. That's right. And, you know, the beauty the beauty of our system, that capitalism has lots of benefits, and there's, but the beauty of capitalism is that um, if you provide value, then those benefits come. But if you don't, you get killed. Mm-hmm. And so what's beautiful about that is that means that we're all spending our time to get better and better and better. If you don't, you're going to get killed. If you're in a market where there's no competition, you can be really bad and continue to get along, <coughs> the government. So, <laughs> but, but you see what I, and, and so I think from, 
brokers are in the best spot when they have a lot of folks competing for their business because they have to those people competing for your business have to keep getting better they have to keep pushing each other and they have to provide better technology and better marketing and better pricing and better products because if they don't they get that is the benefit i so i came up through the capital market side of the house yeah and so I was always on the other side of we were up until 10 years ago, you know, we would sell a lot of our servicing. And so I was very that was my role through either through mostly correspondent relationships. And and I always wanted liquidity. I wanted liquidity. And, and so that was the benefit. I could have I would have never wanted a single source myself. So but it was this balance. Like I wanted liquidity, but I also wanted to work with a couple of really high powered competitive firms that listened to me and kept giving me value and it kept each other honest. But I didn't like I didn't want to have 30. That was a waste of time. I always wanted to be relevant to the companies that I was selling mm-hmm. to because they would listen to me. If I wasn't relevant, relevant, they wouldn't. I've always been mystified when people have 32 partners or 32 rate sheets yeah. that just didn't feel like. You need a relatively small number so you can build process and, and consistency, but you also need enough competition to keep people on. Well, you right. get diluted at some point. That's right. right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's totally diluted. So, I mean, so one thing that's happening in, in our business is there is this like rift between the, the brokers and all this stuff, and there's a lot of stuff that's happening out there. The narrative right now is that, oh, okay, Quicken's the bad guy almost, right? And why would you work with Quicken? Uh, how, how are you changing that perception? You, you know that's it's interesting. Or is there any truth to it? <laughs> well, it, you're you're right. It is a narrative, and it's a narrative that you know certain folks are putting forward. It's 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 interesting. Again, when I was on the cap market side, and people came in, whether it was a mortgage insurance company or it was a it was a lender or whomever, I was always the people that came in and talked about the the value they would provide, the val- and listened to me about what I was trying to accomplish. You know the difference between listening and listening. Listening is like I'm waiting for my time to talk, and listening is, okay, so a second ago you said this, that this is important to you guys. Tell me a little bit more about it. I always thought if they asked me more questions than I asked them, I wanted to work with them because mm-hmm. they were curious about what I was doing. They were interested, and they were really trying to provide value. If they asked a lot of questions and if they were synthesizing what I was saying and trying to help me find value, I really wanted to work with them. I love the companies that were providing value. The companies or the the people that came in that I, I was suspicious about wanted to badmouth. They wanted to badmouth the competition. And I always felt if, you, if you're spending your time badmouthing others, you're either hiding what you don't have or your ego is really thin and you, you know, that's just how you, you did that. So a lot of that narrative of big, bad, whatever is just that. It's to take the eye off the ball of what's really important to, to brokers. Yeah, I mean, we have, a, we have a really large marketing budget and we do that. So it's, it's an easy scapegoat. But the reality is, is that we'd be great. I mean, the narrative is, oh, well, we're just doing this to steal your clients. When that that's just the silliest thing ever because if we did that we'd be out of business in five minutes and we just know that's not true we know that you know when you it's just it's um it's a little <laughs> maddening but we just keep our nose to the grindstone really yeah. um the we were talking before we we started um recording the 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 brokers that are doing really really well the brokers that are they're like i, I don't care I, I don't care. Let's talk about my business. Let's talk about how I'm growing. Let's talk about some of the challenges I'm having. Let's talk about how I'm penetrating the real estate market or the realtors. Let's talk about how I can get into the builder community. Let's talk about some of the technology that I'm, I'm working on or strategy or whatever, that kind of stuff. The ones that are struggling, th- they like those scapegoats. Like, yeah, it's it's that. That's why I'm not doing well. It's this. That's why I'm going to... So yeah. it's kind of a convenient excuse for people that are struggling. Well, I think a, a huge thing and a mindset you should have as a business person or a broker is, you know, how do I do more business? And yes, if, if you're doing a good job, you can retain what you have, but you can only do that by reaching out. You can't expect anyone because there's so many ads above and beyond, let's say, you know, Quicken Loans or whoever calling that client after they close. I mean, they could walk into their bank, they can turn on the TV, they can see the billboard, they can log in online. You have to stay in front of them or they're going to work with someone else regardless. And if you don't do that, you're not doing your job as a broker, in my opinion. So you're talking about so you're talking this is this is is what we're talking about. It's kind of like a play better mentality. The perception in the industry is that uh, from a broker standpoint, that Quicken 
Uh, once they once let's say we use their wholesale, and they go through and Quicken closes the deal. The perception is Quicken now is going to start marketing aggressively to that client, and now take that client for themselves, basically taking it from a, a company like us, um, which is I, I, which is obviously what you're saying is not the case, right? That that isn't the the, the mentality. What Sal's saying is, which, which I think is true and poignant, is it doesn't matter. Somebody's marketing to them, yeah. so we got to stay in front of them regardless. We got to play better, right? If right? that client doesn't call you when they receive a piece of marketing in the mail, which mind you, they get. All the time from different people. Yeah, right. I get it all the time. Yeah, you didn't yeah. deserve that. You should have played better. Yeah, and you know, the, play better. We tell, and we are very intentional. If if a broker, if we get a, a broker's loan, if they're working with us, we are not campaigning to those clients. We wall that off. We do not outbound go after those for retention. Now, if there's a if the client clicks on the dancing bear through one of the lead buy things <sighs> and nine yeah. nine different companies buy the lead and we're one of those or if the client yeah, of course that's the case. But this is here's the other reality. There where the narrative is flawed is that there are certain companies because they don't have retail presence that you're safe. That's a flaw. I mean, I know that most brokers know that's silly, but some some don't. And the reality is the brokers or I'm sorry, the, the, the lenders that don't have that retail presence, most of them are selling their servicing. So they may hold it for a year for tax purposes or whatever, but then they sell it. And we know that most refinances or most next purchases are well beyond a year and they sell it to very large servicing buyers. And those very large servicing buyers pay an awful lot of money a lot of money for that servicing. And so the value that they get when they pay that money is twofold. One, they're getting a stream of cash. They expect that loan will stick around for a while and they get a stream of, of servicing income. But the second is they know some portion of those will either refinance or get their next home with them. Because the companies that these 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 large uh, wholesale lenders sell their servicing to have big retail retention arms. And so that's what's happening. And and so if you think like, oh, well, I'm not selling it to, I'm not brokering through a company that has a retail arm, I'm safe. That's just crazy. That's just, it's just really flawed thinking and a misunderstanding of how things really, really work. Right. And, but the narrative out there is like, take your eye off the ball. No, 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 yeah. you're safe. You're, you're not. Well, I think, it, and it still kind of goes back to, it doesn't really matter even if it is true, right? Because ultimately, if you want to be a successful broker, you have to stay on top of your clients. For sure. And that's. Really what it comes down to if in the broker community is like you need to work with the people who can build your business the best. It's on you to retain it. Sal is very Absolutely. big on like, you know, sometimes I even get in this mode. I'm like, oh, um, this person's – he's like, dude, shut up. It's what we do that matters. It doesn't matter what anybody else does. So that's kind of his mentality. He kind of kicks me in the ass sometimes. Well, I mean, like, if, dude, if you lose a loan, you lost it. Yeah. And yeah. move on. nine times out of ten, it's because you weren't good enough. You know, one of the things I say around the office sometimes is um, – whether it's your fault or not, it's your fault. And what yeah. I mean by that is, <laughs> what I mean by that is, because I feel that that's a powerful statement, is is when someone says, you know, there's two different kinds of people, and this one is like, why did you screw this up? And somebody, there's two people. One person is like, no, I, I didn't screw it up. Hold on a second. I've saved every email that I've ever sent in my life, and I'm gonna go. <laughs> I'll come back. I'm gonna come back, and I'm gonna prove to you. No, no, no. I, I'm right. Uh, hold on. I'm gonna show here. I got this. I'm gonna prove this. I got this. There's another person who's like. I don't know if I did or not. It doesn't matter. You know what? Let's say it's my fault. I own it. I'm going to get better. Let's move. Mm -hmm. And I, I respect yeah. the power that comes with the ownership of problems because that's a strong ego. That's a person who's like, if I've lost something, if I've lost a client, if I've lost an opportunity, it's not someone else's fault. It's my fault. Those are powerful people because they're like, I'm going to now get better. I'm going to do something. They're in control of their lives where the other people are victims. And so always look for people who aren't interested in spending lots and lots of time blaming others. Um, you know, I'm going to throw a few other isms. One is we are the they. Um, and that means, you know, they people. Well, they said and they did and they who, who is they? Mm -hmm. We. We screwed it up. We accomplished this. We did better. We failed. That's power. They that just means I'm a victim and I'm not in control. And I really appreciate and want to work with people that are in control. If the client went somewhere else, it's not. I'm not going to yell and scream. But the other thing, why didn't I stay in front of them? Why mm -hmm. wasn't I relevant? It, what's wrong with my marketing? Did, was I not as persistent about staying in front of them? Is there something about my programs? Can I work on my marketing? Whatever the case is, those are people that succeed. That yeah. succeed. Yeah. And you can't win if you don't lose. You know, yeah. you got to learn from it. You got to lose. It's man. kind of the Losses, yeah. the scorecard.
right? Did you add enough value? That's right. And if you didn't, you probably lost. That's right. And you got to get better. Okay, last question on this topic, and then we'll move on to technology. I, I'm curious, in your opinion, so obviously you've, you, you've got quick, So, like, I'm a consumer, right? Mm-hmm. So, in your opinion, when is it correct to, let's say, go to Quicken or go to a broker? Is there a difference? Is there is there something that brokers do that are better? Or, or Do you see what I mean? Like, is So, I'm a consumer now. Like, okay, I can go to Paul, and I can still go through Quicken, but why would I go through Paul as opposed to going through just directly to Quicken? Because when I was on the other side of the fence, because I was at Quicken, I spent a lot of my career selling kind of against the broker a little bit, right? Back then, it was just like, oh, no, you know, this, and there was always a narrative that I could spin there. Now I'm on this side, and then you kind of have to spin the narrative the other way because it's kind of like, well, don't go to Wells, don't go to Bank of America, don't do this, don't do that because we can do X, right? Um, being that now you kind of have both factions in your house, in your opinion, which, you know, what is better for who, if that makes sense? Yeah, from a consumer's perspective, yeah. I think it comes down to really, if I'm a consumer, I, there is no advantage one like one um, one division or another. It comes down to the individual, and it comes down to the experience. Do I trust you? Yep. That's a big part place to start. <laughs> Do you have the products and the pricing that is in my best interest? That's important. And can you make my experience refinancing or buying a home as easy and as convenient as possible? Do I trust you? Do you have the products and pricing in my best interest? And can you make this a good experience? And if the answer to those three things is yes, it doesn't matter if you're a big company, if you're a small company, if you've got a cool logo, if you've got a terrible logo, it doesn't matter. The rest of it is noise. It really comes down to the the, the tip of the spear. And the tip of the spear is all of us who are speaking to the consumer. And from a consumer's perspective, you can have a terrible experience with a big lender. You can have a terrible experience with a broker. You have a terrible experience with a bank, or you could have a fantastic experience with a bank broker or a big lender. It doesn't, it doesn't matter. It's done down to the individual, which is why though, and you know, I think we're talking, there's a lot of brokers listening today is how do I do those three things? So Number one, how do they trust me? That's largely on all of us. That's largely on the broker. That's our personal integrity. That's the way we run our businesses. That's the way that we per- portray our brand in the marketplace. So that's on us. The second thing is products and pricing. I think that there's a lot of, it's pretty generic in the world, but again, that's where competition comes in. If you have no competition, I, I learned this when I was on the capital market side. If I would just sell to XY, XYZ all the time, over time, XYZ's pricing would get squishy. Mm-hmm. And it's not because they're bad guys. They're capitalists. Right. They're capitalists. They're, they're, they're taking advantage of that. They, so everyone needs to be their own advocate for their pricing and for products. And if, you, if, you just take, if, if you're just selling to one entity it's gonna, it's, and you're not making sure that it's a great deal, you're not going to get the best opportunity, nor will your client. So competition comes in. That last piece, though, this is where I really think, this is where I think the differentiation happens. This is where I think, from a broker's perspective, as to what they can provide their clients comes into play, and that is the, the experience, the client experience. Um, and this isn't like, are your, you know, is your, are your pastries tasty and did you comb your hair in a, a nice way? This is what kind of technology do you have to, for, the, for your clients? What, kind, what does your website look like? How easy, you know, do you, do you have document upload or do, you have to, do they have to bring all their documents to you? Can you get alerts in the middle of the night or do you have to wait for some 47th phone call of the day? Um, how easy can you make it? What kind of technology, what kind of integration, what kind of process do you have? And this is where working with uh, lenders that are that are on the advanced side of technology and process really can change it for for brokers. And when you cha- when you change that experience for the broker, what they can provide, that's what they're providing their clients. This will be the last thing I say. <laughs> you you will see um, there will be brokers over the next five years that will not do well, that will die if they don't adopt the the technology to work with. People, people are no longer going to accept. Just like, yes, there's a few people that go into hardware stores somewhere and like to look around and stuff. But the world is changing very, very quickly, and so if if people aren't changing and adapting to technology, adapting to what people want as far as how they get mortgages, it's going to get increasingly difficult for them to operate in that world. And so that's why they have to continue to evolve, and that's why they have to plug in and work with companies that'll help them. So, so is QLMS, in your opinion? Um, a goal of theirs is to provide 
good technology for the broker community. Is that is that one of your initiatives? I, it's it's the top initiative um, because again, if otherwise anybody can offer a rate sheet. Right. Anybody. Mm-hmm. We we could all we could start a mortgage company tomorrow and kick out a rate sheet. That doesn't take any thinking. That doesn't take any skill. That doesn't take any any um, investment. It really comes down to technology process. Those are two things that are they're going to make the difference. And I think that this market right now is a good test subject to, or at least a transition into that next era because refinances are way down, right? So lenders will probably, or brokers, I should say, will adjust their margin to be competitive no matter what the rate is, right. as long as they're working with the right partner who can get that loan done, provide a good experience to get referrals. That's right. right. If you have an unbelievable experience That's as, all that matters. as a client or as a realtor, yeah. if you're like, that was flawless. And oh, the technology let me know where I was the whole time. I had clear that's really what people want. They want mm-hmm. transparency and certainty. That's what they want. I want to know what's going on and I want to feel good that what I believe is going to happen happens. And if those two things happen, I am good and price is then down the line. I still need a good price, right. but it doesn't it doesn't you just have rise to be competitive. To that's right. That's you don't need to necessarily be the best. And I think that good brokers understand that as well, that it's not about, I don't care about making the most money on one loan. I want to do a lot of loans. That's right. Right. I I call it being scrappy. So like to your point, I think a consumer can get, uh, have a great experience and have have a better avenue for getting a mortgage through a big bank, through a uh, retail direct lender, through a broker. It's all, but it's all about the person, right? It's, um, if the consumer walks straight into a bank, sits down in front of a guy that was like eating a sandwich and watching ESPN on his computer, there's a, lo- a higher likelihood that that's not going to be a great experience because you just put it in their lap, right? They don't really care. Where if you go online, fill out a form, and you get 35 phone calls in five minutes, those are the scrappy people that are going to fight for your business, that give a fuck about what you're doing, and, and are going to fight for you, right, mm-hmm. to give you a good experience. So that's, that's I think, where you want but to with, go. With that being said, I do think things are changing a little bit. People don't want 35 phone calls anymore. Right, you know, but they're, they're, I think that's, they're, their, they're, that's they're to their advantage, though. Yeah, I think 35 is like, it's a lot. It's a lot. But uh, well, let's move on to technology because we're running out of time. And I think this is poignant, obviously, with Quicken. You guys, uh, through the years, have been on the forefront of technology, always. Like, it, it, even when I was there in 2003 through 2008, it was like, it was something, the technology was always a, a, on the forefront. Um, you guys came out with Rocket Mortgage, uh, the digital experience. Um, to be fair, I, I, it's a dig- on the consumer side, it's probably a lot more digital. But the reality is there's still a lot of humans on the background doing a lot of manual stuff to get that, that deal done. When do you see a true digital solution to a mortgage where, like, like we talked about before, you're on your cell phone, you push a couple buttons, you get an approval a few minutes. It still hasn't gotten there, in my opinion. No. You know what's interesting? Um, as far well, let me, let me take a step back. Today at, at Quicken Loans, about it's a small percentage, but it's growing. It's about two to three percent of our refinance loans um, go from what we call we call setup, um, where basically we, the pro, the client has provided us most of the information that we need, to what we call final sign off, meaning we've gotten everything we need in the in from an underwriting perspective, we're done. Um, about two to three percent of our refinances do that in less than forty eight hours. Um, so they're getting property inspection waivers, you know, of course, uh, but the, we're, you know, the client is doing a document upload. We're running an advanced income, so income's being calculated. It does, an underwriter doesn't have to do that. That's being calculated. Um, you're doing same-day title. All these things are happening very, very quickly. Um, you know, it's going through the work number, so you don't have to get a verification of employment. You don't have to call the employer. And if, and if the client, you know, gave the, if we got the deck page and pulled that in, it's happening that fast. It's a small percentage, but I bring that up because it's like a window into the future. Mm-hmm. If you can do it for a small percentage, then you can continue to grow that, and you continue to knock down the barriers that pre- that prevent others from from closing that fast. So we're a ways away from most loans closing like that. But every day, the barriers of what takes so long in our industry and why there's so much human involvement start to fall down. The one part, though, that I strongly believe will remain will be the relationship. 
Um, I, I, you know, there are people that are comfortable with doing everything online, but there's an awful lot of people that want to talk to somebody and want to explore options and want to make sure that, you know, this is not an insignificant transaction. So I think that from that perspective, people who have that relevant relationship with, with clients, with realtors are going to, you know, they're going to do well, but they're only going to do well. And I sound like a broken record, but it's just true. They're only going to do well if they can plug into the technology as well. Because if I trust you, but the process is a dumpster fire, and it's like, and I got to bring stuff in, and, and it's crazy town, and, and it's 40, day, right. and, I, and it, like, then I'm going to be like, I love you, but I got to go with a place that's going to be able to, to do things and take advantage of the modern technology, take mm-hmm. advantage of the things that I heard my Uncle Louie say, and it was so great. So that's why I think that is um, really important. Well, I think also us realizing that a smooth loan process right now that might let's say hey loan closed in 21 days right no no issues appraisal came in that could be the dumpster fire of the future yeah it took 21 right days now to 21 get your days is done, like the, like right? that's our average and it's like pretty as good, opposed right? to like right. hey i mean it could be we could be in a situation in the future where it's like you plug in an address and it's like thumbs up everything's all pre-underwritten and everything somehow you know, Fannie Mae's accepted some AVM in lieu of appraisals, and now it's it's all over. Yeah, right. I, you're approved, but not pre-approved. Yeah, you but to your it. point, Bob. I mean, it, it, I truly see it like this. I see that technology is like the icing <clears throat> on the cake, right? It, it has to enhance the, the 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 relationship, right? And if you don't adopt that, to your point, you're going to become irrelevant pretty quickly, right? So the question to me is, is this is a so if I if I if I'm a broker today, right, and we rely really on our partners to provide because we don't have the resources to build an app to to do this and do all these other things. At what point potentially could it become where and I'm, this is a little doomsday, but I don't think this is going to be the case where you know we're being provided all this stuff and it's not really in house. That could always be taken away from us, right? So that's the fear too as a broker. It's like. If our partner develops something that's so over the top, out of this world, why wouldn't they just keep all that business instead of sharing it with us? It's a, it's a great question. I can't, you know, I can't. Uh, you, you know what a luddite is? Mm-mm. Oh. Enlighten us, Bob. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized I just well, made myself what look like a dork. <laughs> um, but a luddite, is, there were these people. I th- hope I get this right. So if I don't get it perfectly right, be nice to me. <laughs> but th- I think they were. It was a group of people. I think they lived in England, hundred, two hundred years ago, and I, they mostly made um, fab, like they made like wool fabric. They made clothes. Like right? the Amish of England. It, yeah, they did it, but they did it with the handheld machine. You know, they mm-hmm. did the looms the by weaving, hand yeah, and yeah. all that kind of stuff. Stuff. And then all of a sudden came along the, the mechanized loom, right? That mm-hmm. came along. And so when when they brought that to their town, the the Luddites, they were the that was the type of people that, that was the name of these people, they went into these factories and they burned them to the ground. <laughs> They're like, we're gonna stop all this this mechanization, we're gonna stop all this innovation, we're gonna burn it. That's our you know, that's our solution. Yeah. And of course you can't stop it, right? You can't stop it. And um but what's interesting, something interesting happened. Um, you would think like, oh, well, all these people were completely out of a job. In, in the short run, I'm sure some did because the, the loom, the mechanized loom could do it much faster than they could. But something really interesting happened. When the price of clothing started to fall because the mechanized loom made it easier to make more clothing, people bought more clothing. Instead of people just having two pairs of pants and two shirts, and yeah. that was all they could afford because yeah. that was like a month's wages. I can now afford more. And, and then all of a sudden, the people used to do the loom by hand, work the machine, and they had jobs. And so, so yes, I'm not saying that the world is perfect. When, when innovation comes, we saw that here in Detroit. When, when, when robotics and that kind of thing, it really was difficult for a lot of workers. But the prices of cars fell, um, and then the, the, you know, the value of cars went higher. So I say all that because that's our industry. The, the price is going to fall. The ease of getting a mortgage is going to change. There's undoubtedly going to be some losers. I'm just going to be, you know, I, I think, you know, if you're like some of the roles that are pretty, pretty rote and some of those roles are going to go away, but there's going to be a lot of winners too. And I really think um, high functioning, really talented loan officers will benefit. Why? Because I can do more now. I'm not screwing around in the pipeline all the time. I'm not trying to figure out what stuff's going on. It's happening faster. Things are being uploaded in an automated fashion. Income is being calculated. I don't have to sit there and hold on wait with an underwriter and wait for somebody else's decision. It's happening. I'm in control. Can you imagine? Let's just dream for a second. 
What if, I mean, you can go, how long does it take to finance a car? Same day. Same day. Same day. Yeah. You're, and by the way, you can roll, the collateral has wheels on it, and it can yeah. go away at 70 <laughs> miles an hour. But well, let's just say that we can get to a place where from, from application to close, that can happen in a couple days. And I know we got trid these days and stuff, mm-hmm. but let's just say it could happen in a couple days. So we would need less people in our industry, and that's a bummer. But on the other hand, if I'm a high-powered loan officer who has a lot of relevance, wouldn't I just crush it? Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, just crush it. Yeah, and that's the part that I think starts to get exciting. It's how you view the world. You're not going to stop it. You're not going to stop technology. Can you, instead of it being a being a horse that runs you over, can you ride that horse? Right. The loan yeah. officers that swim in their pipeline and want to know everything about the process and really just delve into the details, they're going to go away. Yeah. So I, it's the people that are front end focused, to creating relationships. I, I, I call those loan sherpas. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, and look, loan <laughs> sherpas have had a lot of value over the years because it's a hard, confusing process. It's weird. It's a hard, confusing process. So a big value of loan officers to clients was, I'm going to be your loan sherpa. I'm going to walk you through this this hard, confusing process and get you to the other end. But as the process gets easier and easier and easier, the value of being a loan sherpa falls, but the value of being an influencer and a persuader and being relevant in your marketplace and being a rainmaker goes up. Those people yeah. are going to kill it. You have, yep. to, you have to be the Sherpa that opens the uh, heated gondola to the mount, top of the <laughs> mountain, right? I don't, what, <laughs> what does that mean? He gets it. So, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Bob, we got to wrap this up. Uh, if you, so if you had one message to give the broker community about what QLMS is doing and, and kind of trying to ch- you know, change the narrative a little bit uh, across the board, obviously for the 14 people that are listening might hear it. Can I have two messages? Yeah, yeah. Um, Number one message is, is thank you. Um, I, I can't tell you how, how impressed I am when I talk to, you know, you talk about being scrappy. I love, we, you know, our company, we're big now, but we started out, Dan started this company, he and his brother out of the back of their car. That was scrappy. Mm-hmm. And um, so there's, that's, the, that's at the root of who we are as a company is that scrappiness, that entrepreneurialism. And I get energized talking to, to brokers around this country because Every month they start at zero, and there's a, there's a there is something so respectable and honorable about that. There's no like, well, yeah, my my check will cash. They start at zero, and they have to they have to scrap it out and fight it out every single month. They have to innovate. They have to know their market. They have to get better, and and I draw from that. And so and we don't take that for granted. And I think most most lenders don't either. Uh, and we appreciate that, and and we honor that. The second thing, though, I think I'd like to say is is that. Yeah, QLMS is growing. We doubled, more than doubled. We're up 150 percent year over year. Um, we will do the same thing next year. We are we are coming after it in a big way. We love this market, um, and um, but we're only going to be as good as the value we can provide. And so that's our job every day is to is to kick butt and provide things to the broker community that they need that differentiates them in the marketplace. Awesome. So where. For all the brokers that are listening, that was supposed to be the last question. Well, I know, but I, I don't okay. ask. So, all the brokers that are listening that are maybe intrigued a little bit about finding out more about what you guys are offering or what you can offer them, how can they find out? How can they get a hold or get more information? Yeah, I mean, gosh, they can start with email me, bobwalters at quickenloans.com. I'll get it to the right people, um, but hopefully they know an account executive in their area. Um, but um, but that's that's just it. Give us a call, email me, and um, let's let's go. All right, guys. So that's our show. Thank you all for listening. Uh, find us on uh, you know all the podcast stuff, right? Just wherever, wherever, like we're everywhere right now. We have a website. You, I wonder, can you ask Alexa to find us? No, dude. Someone no, but you can it. ask Someone Alexa and get a mortgage now. <laughs> yes, you can. <laughs> yeah, you can. So uh, go to ire dot com. We'll be on there. Uh, you can go to our, our Facebook page. We'll, we'll you know we'll be all over the place. How you doing, Jessica? You good? Thank you for for helping us today. Great. Thanks. Yeah. yeah. So, Sal, you look good. Yeah, thanks. Uh, get a haircut, man. Dude, you've been wanting to get a haircut for like like weeks. Yes, I have. Bob, thank you so much for doing the show. You're we welcome. really appreciate thank you guys. it. Thanks for coming in. Uh, you guys have a great day. See you guys later. You've been listening to Inside Real Estate, the nation's top real estate, real estate podcast. Show. Don't forget.